Hi everybody, I'm Dave Sweeney. And this is your Tour de Pod video. I really enjoy the Monkey Hill Prologue course in Edmonton because uh, it's kind of got everything. And what I actually really like is that you start out downhill because the worst I am, I could never be a swimmer, you know. I could never go from the blocks and feel good immediately, you know. I kind of got to warm into it. I'm getting old or something. But rolling down that hill kind of warms you up. And, uh, and then you get up to speed along the river and then you just got to make this incredible effort to go up Monkey Hill. It's, it's just a really neat experience because the crowd's going, you can't hear anything, you know, and you're just flying, you know, flying all over your bike and you're hoping that you don't blow up by the top and you're hoping you don't have to shift gears. And uh, so I really enjoy that uh, quite a bit because uh, once you get over that hill and if you feel good, then, you know, you got another descent to recover. back along the river and if you can if you can finish strongly, you know, you do well. You know, this year we could just tell from the start of the year that this guy's really serious, <laughs> and uh, you know he was just—he just looked so good. I mean, he had the legs of the Peloton, so to speak. You know, he was so ripped, um, and, and he had put in so much work and so much effort. And he really focused on the Dupont. I wasn't truthfully surprised when he, you know, come off the blocks and get second in the prologue. And I know that he was really, really uh, uh, depressed when Greg came across the line. And, to buy a second or whatever it was. It's a good little indicator of who's taking the race really, really seriously straight away and who do we think, what teams do we think are going to be factors, at least initially. I'm happy. It's a good start. <laughs> But it's just a prologue. Don't forget, there's still 10 days to go. It's, just, it's nice to win a race, first race in, uh, since uh, what, 1990 Tour de France. That's right. So that's, that's nice to win. You know, it's funny. You you have all these guys come from Europe and all they've heard is how great America, how good the weather is and everything. And we're driving down there and we're just thinking, this is so bleak. <laughs> and I felt bad for Dover because, you know, here they've probably gotten so pumped up and I did a press conference there. I mean, they were so jazzed to do this race. And you go down there and there's just these raindrops coming down that, you know, were the size of small children. They just... <laughs> I need a shower curtain be good for something. <laughs> And it's so cold out there, and there's just, I mean, deserted. Anybody would be foolish to go out of their house. And any, anybody would be even more foolish to ride a bike. It was true, uh, true, truly miserable conditions, which, you know, I guess every, is, is good for a bike race, you know, you got to have it all, you got to have that Euro, everybody wants the Euro, Euro flavor, well, we got it, Dover to Wilmington, that was, that was truly as uh, harsh as it gets. First stage was, was basically like, let's just get to Wilmington and get into our hotel room as fast as possible. I mean, you were very, we were, everybody was really cold, and uh, Zed fortunately just kind of took up the pace, you know, somebody took off, and 
and uh, we roll, reeled them in towards town. But the big concern actually were the, these bridges, you know, and they were, well, geez, they're kind of neutralized, but they're not. And the first bridge I thought was neutralized, everybody goes and sprinting off after it, and I go, well, okay, I'm going to take note of that the second time around. So the second time we come to, to, the, to the, the bridge before town, you know, and they're trying to stop us, and the riders are keeping going, keeping going, keeping going, and finally we just kind of like go flying across this bridge, and I'm thinking, they're not going to stop us. I better be right at the front. And so, uh, you know, it worked out okay because it wasn't that bad. It's just those scrape bridges are really slippery. And, uh, and then we just kind of set up for the sprint and then the phone rang. <laughs> and I do the same thing on the next corner. They just like slow way down and I just shoot into the, in, into the lead. And I probably should have gone. I didn't. You know, I waited again. And by then I couldn't get my momentum going. And, you know, Zanoli and the German and, you know, I don't know who got third. Darren Stockton was the guy who took off, actually, early. And those guys just went by us, on the, sort of on the other side of the road, and, and I never even got over it. They just had the speed, and, and that kind of a sprint uphill, it's really hard to get your momentum up. And they were, they were going, and so Darren actually uh, provided the uh, good wheel for, for those two, for Torsten, Willem, and, and Zanoli. And I think Zanoli was just so shocked that, you know, who is this guy, you know? <laughs> Give me a break. And Torsten turned out to be a fabulous sprinter and a real character and a wonderful guy. And so, uh, you know, now that I know him, I, I say, good job. The big time trial. Yeah, in a race like the DuPont, the uh, time trials always prove to be so critical. And, um, you know, it's interesting putting a time trial at the start and then having one at the finish because it's going to set a tone. Both of them are going to set a real tone for the race. So the time trial was uh, to be critical certainly for Coors Light and um, we kind of focused on that you know I, I the way I ride a race like that is just to get out there and uh, you know kind of ride fairly hard but not to kill myself because I don't really have a GC goal or chance anyway but I know that I know that Steve Swart and Dave Mann were, were very serious about that time trial and I thought that they would both like the course it was a real power course and um, and Dave just rode, you know, fabulous. I mean, he is just so strong. Both those guys are so strong, and they just crush us every time we train with them. And so, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of waiting for, like, okay, just do it to everybody else when there's actually a race going on. That would be great. <laughs> I don't know where that, the power of Dave Mann comes from. Uh, you know, he is, he is just unbelievable. <laughs> I've never seen a guy who can, who can just ride, you know, an entire group of riders into the ground like he can. <laughs> he has so much power. It's just phenomenal. And he's always been that way. I mean, he was telling us when he was in Britain that after a while that, that people would just completely shy away from him. They'd just turn the other way when they saw him showing up to a training ride. They'd flee because, uh, you know, the guy, you just don't want to be around this guy because he'll kill you, he'll crush you. And um, he does that to our team fairly regularly, so now we never ride together as a team. <laughs> he and Swart have this psychology of that you just go out and that you just, you know, go as hard as you can, and if you're better than the next guy, then he blows up, and if he's better than you, you blow up. <laughs> I'm like, going, I don't want to do that. <laughs>
Greg Lamont flatting or not, um, I don't know how that would have affected the overall s uh, position of him, but I know that, uh, you know, I really feel like Dave Mann, certainly with his time and effort, wasn't going to be denied. And our stage winner, thank you, Jamie Murray, group manager of DuPont Special Events. Uh, well, I can't say I was looking forward to the Poconos because even though I had gotten second there the year before, it was really, really a suffer fest. And getting over those hills, I had remembered that I had just given everything to get over them. And then this year, you know, when it's at the start of the race, sometimes your body isn't really, you know, it takes a few days to really ride into a race and, and, and like clean me. I definitely wasn't feeling that. So long since I've been outside. Long hours from my welcome time Wanna see it for myself Take the word of no one else Don't care what the boss men say Gonna go outside and play the sunshine 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 Walking along with a friend of mine now Sunshine Dave Mann and Steve Schwartz riding so well in that in that time trial really changed the whole way that Peter's Light as a team looked at the race. And so it kind of, you know, my any any chance or thought I would have had to say do the sprint jersey again was kind of like psh, out of there, pal, because uh, we got the two guys we have on the team who are going to do the work, they're in the lead. <laughs> and the two leaders have to wait for the mountains. So that leaves three of you. <laughs> and sorry, Davis, you've got to go to work. <laughs> Last year, the battle was between PDM and Zed, so both of them felt comfortable with the final day, which was a time trial. Consequently, there was virtually no attacking, and those two teams just rode tempo. Zed mostly rode tempo all day, kept the field all together. This time, it's early in the race, and it has the potential to be a hard and decisive stage just because of all the hills. Consequently, I expect to be a lot of, a lot of attacking today. Line. Nickman is just riding about uh, 40k an hour just to keep the tempo high enough that no one wants to attack. So as soon as he swings off and Farmer swings off, then the attacks will start coming. As long as we can keep the tempo at, at uh, 40k, generally speaking, it will all stay together. But 118 miles, nobody can do that. Nobody on our team, anyway. Yeah, I'm sure you'll see radio communications with the riders. Motorola is pushing the technology to develop a miniaturized system, and it's, it has two improvements. It gets information to the riders immediately, and it also makes it a lot safer because the car doesn't have to go up into the peloton as much. The disadvantage of it is you uh, you take away a lot of the decision making from the riders. You, if the director is always going to be making the call on stuff, you end up not uh, not letting the riders race and make as many decisions on their own.
front and he's riding, he's riding. Roy spends about 60 miles on the front as he was to do for every day for the next week. And, uh, and then he starts to get a little tired and Dave Farmer's up there and he starts to get a little tired and then Alexi's kind of looking back like, where is it going? You know, and he starts to kind of panic because there's a Russian up there and so I get up there and do my bid, of course, all in the time before the last time up the hill. So the minute we hit the, the, the last hard hill, it was you know, Jettison City. team didn't ride that well. Uh, we spent a little too much energy kind of securing the jersey and then the phone rang. This is it. This is the one we've been waiting for. Come on. Bring it home, Stratford. Stage winner, Uwe Preisler of the German amateur national team. The, the Poconos especially was a real indication that, boy, these German guys are pretty serious. And, uh, you know, we may be big hotshot pros, but <laughs> those guys are going to just take us to the cleaners if we don't get it together. Alright, we get all three of you guys to turn around now and face the crowd the other way as well. One thing I think that the directors of the race, the DuPont race, tried to do this year was to get the climbs more towards the end of the race. And um, unfortunately, usually they'd leave the climbs a little too far out. And so that was the case in Hershey, was that you ride along all day and all the main riders know they just got to get over this one two mile hill and it's then it's still 30 miles to the finish. And so no matter how hard you go over that hill, no matter how much it splits up, you know, who's going to commit to making the effort to, to, to staying away for 30 miles? And so again, I think the pattern started to get to establish that they we're going to put a hill at the end of the race, but it's too far away from the finish to make any real change. And so you're always going to, you're going to have these group finishes day after day. It won't be the whole pack, but it's going to be 30, 40, 50 guys. And, uh, and that was the case with, with Hershey, again, with Coors Light controlling the race. Uh, up until that hill, basically, and to that point, um, you know, our job was done, and it was, you know, the lion's share was Roy and Dave Farmer and myself. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thinking about you. La fête de mer is Happy Mother's Day ah. in French. How do you say in Dutch? La fête de mer in French? How do you say in Dutch? Gelukkige Moedersdag. The what? Gelukkige Moedersdag. The hut?
teams are actually doing all of the work now to try and get your lead away from you. I think uh, everybody's playing a bit of a a, uh, a tactic game at the moment. Everybody's saving themselves. They know that there are some hard stages to come, and I'm, at the moment that our team's having to work hard to defend the jersey. So I guess they're not too intent on taking the jersey just yet. You need to maintain an, an actual edge and you have to maintain a perceived edge. And so, you know, we're not a European team and although we're, we're known as individuals, some of us, and respected in Europe, you know, we need to make it known that when these teams come to America, it's like, hey, this is our country, this is our race, and, you know, we're, we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to be taking a backseat to anybody. nice to be in the lead position early, but it just means you end up using your team up. Hopefully you got enough silver bullets to last to the last day. That's where the, the battle is going to be. Cold is in uh, Washington, D.C. Hershey to Hagerstown, the one stage where uh, our director, Lem Petty John, said, okay, Davis, I don't, I don't want you to work today. Save it for the finish. Good finish for you. You know, you need some morale. Come on, pal, let's do it. And so I'm relaxed. I'm in there. I'm pedaling. We pedaled really, really slow for a long time because it was a pretty long stage. It was really hot. And there was a climb I had to get over, but it wasn't that bad, and I knew I could do it. And, oh, man, I couldn't believe it. I get to the finish. I'm feeling really good. And this is just like the story, like the prologue I punctured. You know, the next day I was off. I mean, the story of my DuPont is, is right here because Finishing circuit, great crowd in Hagerstown. It was really fun. Yeah. Lap and it's really getting hairy. You're flying down this back stretch, and you know, the Motorola team's trying to keep their lead out going, but they can't go fast enough, and it's starting to swarm around us. The, the Chevrolet Sheriff's team, you know, tries to make a move into the second to last corner, and it's like, no way, you guys, you know, they're going so fast, and uh, they end up, you know, on somebody's porch. And, and so I'm thinking, I don't believe this. I've survived. I've made it, you know. Haig's the only guy ahead. Phil's right in front of me. Zanoli's behind me. I know Phil's going to go after Haig. I got the sweet lead out. I'm ready. I'm going. We come flying up our hill, go around this corner. I've gone around twice before, and I just, boom, ah, wheels go right out from under me. I can't believe it. You know, it's just like, no, no, no. And you know, I'm just skittering across the pavement going, oh, that was the easiest win you ever gave Phil Anderson. Because when I fell, Everybody stopped, and Phil just kind of looked back and go, hey, where'd you guys go, you know? <laughs> and all he had to do was pop after Steve, and that was it. That was all she wrote, but I was kind of upset.
race leader's jersey on his back. Please welcome once again our race leader, Dave Mann. Dave Mann. Dave Mann. Boy, the, the DuPont has the capacity to run some of the longest stages in the existence in the history of bike racing. I mean, you know, I don't know what it is, but I would prefer not to see races that long because we start out and, you know, we actually went out pretty fast because people want to say, try to take this, the flyer of their life and get off for 150 miles. But once that settled down, not going to happen. You know, we're just pedaling out there and it's just a, it's just a tour of the countryside, you know, you're eating like a pig because you're bored. And so, um, <laughs> you're just kind of waiting for the race to start, basically. Yeah, for you guys, I mean, it's like the ultimate training ride. It is, you know. I'm doing this, man. We're not burning hardly any calories. 200 I mean, that's all I mean. 200 k. Rider in the front there, Patrick Evenpole, who's coming into the picture here as a good climber, riding for the Belgian Polstrop team, and it's him who's attacking now as he goes away, Clava Roller. He immediately takes his wheel and then finds the speed. This man is superb in the King of the Mountains, and look at the little Biakov just behind him, the Soviet. He's on his wheel too. Clava Roller seems to have more speed. Well, that'll come with age for the young Russian rider, but he's ridden well there to claim second place on top of the climb. The thing that, that Jim Markowitz has done is that, you know, there wouldn't be a Coors Light team without a Jim Markowitz, and even there wouldn't even be an understanding of how do you operate a team, how do you put it together, how do you support it, because Jim was the first guy to really take American cycling to another level by getting a good sponsor and organizing a team and providing it with the support you need and getting, you know, all the talent that uh, you would want and, and really pulling it together and gelling it. A group went off with, with all these good guys in there, and one of every team. And Phil's up there, and Steve's up there, and you know, uh, Zed's got a guy up there, and all these good guys. But what happened was that it was a long ways to go to the finish, and we thought, you know, hey, this might be the race. You know, they're gone. But up there, they're going, we're not working together. I'm not calling you, you know. And they just are attacking each other, and it was just, it was a, it, you know, it was hell break.
Hincap, he made the, the, the kind of uh, dilettante move that you can get away with if you're on the U.S. national team. But, boy, if any pro had done it, they would have hammered him. Because the guy took off when half the field pulled over for a piss stop. That was the time he went, you know, and I know Carmichael's in his ear going, go now, go now. <laughs> and uh, it was only funny because of um, the Bola team had one of the guys that attacked in the feed zone before that. And, oh, man, you should have seen the, the uh, grief that guy caught. We caught the guy, and bottles are flying, and people are screaming at him, and he's just cowering, you know. And I'm just thinking, boy, if we catch Hincapie before the finish, the guy is going to be seriously hurting. you got to give him full credit. He took off and it was a long race and uh, he held him off for a long time and he did a good ride. But that was a very hard course and there was a hard climb uh, before the final climb and then I think the final climb was harder than anybody expected. And um, you know it, it broke up pretty well and that's the kind of stage finishes that they need to have a few more of in the DuPont, truthfully, to break it up a little bit more because you almost have to finish on a really hard hill um, and to, to make the difference between these guys because they're so good.
I would, I would have cracked in the last 500 meters. I lost contact with 1k. Yeah. But Steve's got it, isn't he, honey? Yeah, I think so. Dog got it with 2nd. Who's some glass in there? Too. Yeah, that's Steve's glass. Yeah, that's Steve's glass. Let's get all of you guys up on that top step. Hot Lake Falls Falls, stage winner in the middle for Sand. He's in that Motorola sandwich. Dagato for second. And Phil Anderson for third. Uh, live television coverage. Riders ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. This is the day Scott McKinley, known as a sprinter, takes off, makes the perfect solo move. You know, the big boss from Italy of their of their of the Spago team had come in. Mike Neal's like, oh really, you guys, you know, I want to see something now. So Scott made a great move. We weren't concerned with Scott McKinley. You know, I mean, hey, he's an old, he was on 7-Eleven, you gotta take care of your own. But um, he made a good move and we just set a certain amount of tempo. I think Dave is, was pleased with the way he had ridden, and there's a lot of pressure to having to carry this jersey around for every day. And Steve, we had really noticed that Steve Swart was really the guy who was riding the race like the winner, you know? Whereas Dave was riding like, I'm the leader now, and we'll see how long it lasts. Steve was riding like, just really, really carefully and cautiously. And whenever there was a big break with big guys in there, he was in it. But the rest of the time, he was really quiet, he was saving his energy, he was staying behind the wheels and doing everything right. So we're thinking, you know, this guy's clued in. And this is kind of where our altercations with Motorola started, it was on this stage, because um, 
what happened was that they obviously wanted to win the stage. You know, Phil put on the monster chain ring, you know, knew this downhill finish. So they wanted to win the stage, but they wanted to use us to do it. And so after we had been up there just setting the pace for a long time, just to, just to keep the field going, to keep Scott within a reasonable distance, then, you know, they ride up to us and they, come on, you guys, come on, let's work together, let's go. And we're like, hey, we're going as fast as we need to go. You want to go faster? Go ahead. And so instead of just taking up the pace, they were going, well, oh, well, Coors Light isn't going to work with us. So they started attacking. Anderson. In there doing their attacking was when Andy Bishop, you know, had come across a motorcycle and then fallen over. Hey, hold on, Michael. He cut into me, man. I was just cut standing straight. Me. I was riding straight and you ran into the back of me. There's several ways to start up a race when you're going along. One is that, you know, if you want to control the pace, you put your team on the front and you pick it up and you start going and you start riding really hard. And then whatever is happening up the road, you know, hopefully you bring it back. The other way is, which is not a, which is much more careless, is to just start attacking so that, you know, you get the field going and you get the race going so it's attack, 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 speed increases, you catch the guys up front, but you never know what's going to happen. You know, you might attack one guy who you don't, who can't even win the race for you. Another guy goes up there, another guy goes up there, field sits up, and then you got this break. And so. Um, I felt like that they should have just taken the bull by the horns and do the right thing, and they eventually did. You know, Kiefel gets up there, and he's a good pro, and Zanoli, and they just start, they just start riding really hard.
last year with Steve. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've got to keep up the tradition there. But I think having ridden this last year was a big advantage, you know, because, uh, you know, I knew the finish and, uh, you know, put on a, a good gear for the, for the uh, sprint today. Bigger than last year, so, um, you know, it paid off. <laughs> From the gun to a key to go. <laughs> That's it. I didn't. I couldn't have done anything else. I mean, I was going as hard as I could for 85 miles there, and uh, they caught me with a K to go. I started leading it out, and then I was like, "Oh man, I think I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make it because everybody swarms around that corner." So I led a few guys ahead of me, and then coming in that last corner, everybody was hesitant because the guys who didn't do it last year didn't know. But I knew that you didn't have to use your brakes, so I was just in the slipstream of Anderson and uh, started sprinting as fast as I could. But I had a 53. He has a 55, so I guess I gotta learn how to put on a bigger gear for these these things when I know the finish. Oh, I can't say I felt great. I'm not too confident about tomorrow. But let's see. I'm, what can I say? I don't feel great. I'm not, I'm not with the best climbers. I'm not far, but I'm not with them. Smart, ladies and gentlemen, remains the race leader. You know, Homestead to Wintergreen, I was kind of okay because for once, <laughs> Roy and I only have to take the pace, uh, you know, for so long, and then it's up to the other guys to just do whatever they got to do.
Tu crois qu'ils iraient euh, derrière le poteau principal Oui, ça va, Armstrong, Lewis et Gros, ça va être Il y a juste des stillings qui sont là. Ok, Actually, the climb out of Vesuvius was really a hard climb. It was steep, and um, and we just had gotten reports that uh, that actually Greg was a little bit behind and Steve was in the front group, and so we started to really feel like Steve was was going to pull through with this. At that point, Greg really recouped and, and dug down and, you know, was Greg Lamont. Sans mettre derrière, tu as ri. Mais tu montes à ton train et tu n'attendras que là-haut, hein. Ok
Vous avez fait du beau travail les gars, c'est bien. C'est bien Eric. Atlo il va les tuer mais Greg il est dans le dur. Ça fait rien, tant pis hein. C'est le coureur qui a rejoint dans le jet de Lyon. You can ride with the yellow jersey in Le Mans, please. Mavic, in front of me. Go up, go up. Ils sont à 1 km 
The definitely Spago is, is doing the most with the least. Obviously Mike Neal is just a very capable coach and so if you have the personnel and they can you know keep the mind frame to do it even though they're not making much out of it, they do a good job and, and, and that was the case. Pulled out a little more of what he needed to do than Steve did and so Steve lost some time. And, uh, but again, you know, even on that severe of a climb, boy, people were pretty tight. <laughs> we're one and two? We're one and two? Yeah. All right. I think you're leader by one gonna, second from that lead. One second, okay. I'm going to take him on the time. <laughs> He's going to go for the bonus uh, tomorrow. He can have the <laughs> It's a very competitive field here. Everybody's got different goals, you know. Now, you know, my goal came from getting from the last phase to the first phase. Now I'm going for uh, winning the race. To Motorola's Motorman, Phil Anderson. of a second now separate second place overall Adelaide Balsmall from new race leader Greg Lamont. <laughs> Dana Percival, Chief Operating Officer of the Wintergreen, 13 of a second, Lamont. One thing that I really enjoyed about the race this year was how diverse the um, results were in terms of that it was the American-based teams who were getting a lot of the results. And that hasn't been the case in the past. If American teams other than, say, 7-Eleven or Motorola were just kind of like, Pfft, you know, even Coors Light a couple years ago was like, Pfft, you know, yeah, you guys are, you know, just stay behind us. But um, the Americans rode really well, and the, and the American teams rode really well. And I think the big difference between this year and last year was that last year it was always, you know, the Spanish team taking the flyer and winning the stage, or, or the Belgian team. And man, that didn't happen this year. You know, it was always the American teams that came to the front. And so I think that was really a nice statement about the evolution of the racing scene here. <laughs> 
If I had a gun, I'd shoot those Amaya guys, man. Yeah? Oh. Jets, huh? God, every time we go slow, we can't even relax at all. You know, these guys are just... Couldn't win. I guess they can't win a race any other way, so they got to try it with the jit mode, you know? Yeah. Well, listen, Motorola. Uh, Motorola uh, really won't let things get too far away. Yeah, that's okay. They were they're gonna squish like it. Uh, they were chasing like crazy back there. Yeah, because see, they want to keep it together so uh, Phil can get the time bonus and also uh, the, the time bonus sprint and the stage win. Yeah. Z and uh, Coors, these other squads. They don't really care. They'd rather see these yeah. guys get up the road yeah, just as long let that as they guy don't go really. And yeah. Then, uh, Motorola went nuts. Yeah. So just that's why I don't really want to put out too much effort on this stage because it really won't be worth it. Tomorrow we can be more, much more aggressive, and it's a stage that's advantageous for a breakaway. A stage like this, it's going to be Grupo Compacto the whole yeah, day. Yeah, Motorola looks like they don't want anything to go. Yeah. Right they they feel real confident that uh, Phil can get the stage. We need to, you need anything more to eat. By the time we get to Winter Green to Richmond, it's a question of time bonuses, and Phil was uh, obviously collecting a lot of time in time bonus, making up more time, making up more time, sort of becoming a concern for us as well as Greg. And, uh, you know, so it became obvious that, okay, this is probably going to come down to a field sprint. You know, Davis, you got to get into your mode now, and uh, you got to win this stage because we can't afford to have Phil make up any more time. And I'm sure with Motorola, it's just like, okay, Phil has got to win the stage because he's got to get as much time as he can. And so you kind of put a classic battle and then you assign know, somebody like uh, Zanoli to say, okay, you know, watch Phil's wheel and, uh, and make sure that uh, nobody, nobody can, can uh, pass Phil in the final. It becomes for, for a nasty situation. Then you get into Richmond and it's been a long race and it was rainy and wet and, you know, so you're, you're whatever, eight, nine days into this thing, you're kind of tired. And you get onto the circuit where you got a pretty hard hill, and then you got this incredibly fast downhill finish. You know, kind of a finish I would actually love. You know, a death-defying cor two corners and then a short sprint up the hill. It's like, who has the, who has the uh, you know, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, to get those corners, you know, is going to win the race. And I mean, I kind of like that. So anyway, we come into this finish, and. And I'm up there and I'm having no problem, but I don't have any team around me and most of Motorola is up there. And uh, you know, I don't want to be too soon to the front of this race. And I'm on the front going down this hill and we still got a long ways to go these corners. So I'm kind of like going, oh geez, I don't want to kill myself now. Motorola swoops around me and um, you know, I got like three of them. I mean, Phil comes and he's, and he's coming around in front of me. Zanoli's on his, this side and you know, Frankie Andreo's on this side. And, I'm, and so I'm just, fully hemmed in. You know, I was just in the position where I was so intent on what I had to do, and I think probably that Zanoli was too. Uh, and, you know, you got this big guy leaning on you, and I'm just like, yeah, buffeting down there. It's, you know, I mean, it was incredible the amount of pressure that this big guy is putting on my arm, but, you know, I was locked, and I, and I got some good arms, so I was holding myself in, and I had to because I couldn't go out to the right. There's somebody right here, and I wasn't going to back out. So, you know, we're like this, and we're getting close to the corner, and I think just because of the fact that I wouldn't back down, and Zanoli, you know, whatever it was, it was just the reaction to, like, what am I going to do? You know, or this guy isn't backing down, I don't believe it. He just comes out with his backhand. I was so surprised that we fly into this corner. You know, Phil's just trying to take the corner, and I'm, like, not even breaking because I'm, and my nose is bleeding, and I'm so shocked that I just shoot right inside him, you know, and kind of glance off the opposite curve, like, whoa! You know, and all of a sudden, I'm just in the lead, you know, and I'm just, like, going, oh, my gosh, what is going on? And I, then I'd, like, start lumbering down the next stretch of the corner, and right away I knew I didn't have it because I just didn't, like, completely shattered my physique. I mean, I, I'm just like, what's wrong with me, you know? And I come out of that last corner, and I had this big lead because I'd gone so hard into those corners unintentionally. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to finish straight, and I was like, <laughs> you know, frothing at the mouth. And man, when Phil came by me, I mean, I, I was sprinting so weakly. Anderson, another 10 seconds. Anderson, another 
We uh, just met with the commissars and they considered the protest filed by Len Pettijohn and also had this corroborated by the uh, German writer Wilhelm. Um, the decision that was made is that Michael Zanoli has been disqualified from the race and also fined per the rules 1,000 Swiss francs. We used to be fairly good friends because there was good respect there and I think that because he hit me he, he really um, showed that he lacked a certain respect for me so you know it killed my respect for him. We don't have a jersey. We don't have to protect anything. Hey, let's gamble. Let's go for this. And Alexi finally was on fire. You know, he had wanted to ride a good big punt. He'd been really up and down. He'd been to the team. And man, when we saw him take off, we're like, he's got to get boys, you know. Because <laughs> when he gets the mission, you know, he's, a, he's really unstoppable. And it was funny because we're riding around Richmond and we're just touring and this break is going, you know, six, seven, eight minutes and people are like booing us like, hey, we came to see a bike race, all right? And I'm going, you, you see one, you just got to wait a little while, you know, and then we, we, you know, they kicked in and it had to be one of the most exciting races ever. I mean, it was unbelievable. Motorola really kicked it hard and really Kiefel and, and Frankie Andreu just, just went to the, to the mat, you know. And, and they just went wild the last, uh, the last two laps, and, and it's coming back really quick. We're going up the, the hill on the back stretch, and they're like right there, and I'm just thinking, I don't believe this. And, and because of the hill, those guys blew up. And so then we were all at the front, and Greg didn't want to see him catch because he didn't want to get Phil the jersey. So all our teams are kind of up there, and we're just like trying to hold everybody off, and we're just looking around, and we're like going, please don't anybody go. <laughs> You know, Greg's a better time trialer than I am uh, when he's on top form, and uh, you know he's obviously he's already shown that that he's in very good condition. So, um, you know, it's really uh, man to man, man against man here. Well, that's it. The sea is the best. If I have a good day and uh, someone has, you know, a bad day, you know, I can. It's it's so so close. You know, 14 seconds can be made and it can be lost. So, like, uh, you know, we're just going to be on the day.
Craig is just, uh, you know, the epitome of Arrow Man. And, and he, uh, you know, he's done a lot to improve his aerodynamics on the bike, but he was just made to be a bike rider. does have all the elements that you would ever want in a great bike racer. You know, he has the psychology for it. When he wants to do well, he does. Um, and when he's well prepared, he does, you know, he does wondrous things. There you have it, 1992 Tour DuPont from the Finney family. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Thinking of you, nothing's lost, there ain't no part except